I don't think I have to say any, anything in the presence of such distinguished panelists, but I would like to explain sort of broadly what we're doing. Um, nowadays, when anybody wants to fix Afghanistan, they have a political piece, which is sort of what we started off in the, you know, with in the morning. Uh, they have a, a security piece. We sort of uh, touched on that. Um, they, they have a piece about sort of reconciliation and uh, dealing with the Taliban, which is what we're going to do after this. But they also have a regional framework piece. Uh, and when people do critiques of what's going, uh, going wrong, they generally come down very heavily on the failure to put together an effective regional framework which might support progress in Afghanistan. And I suspect this is what we're going to address now, given the um, distinguished panelists that we got together. Uh, we're going to start off with the home team, which is um, Hassan Abbas. Um, and I'm just going to leave it to, uh, to everybody to come in with your, with your uh, contribution to the regional piece. Uh, 15 minutes each um, and biting questions at the end. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. <clears throat> I think we all know that there is a consensus among historians, analysts, security experts that historically developments within Afghanistan have been inextricably linked with, re with the region, um, especially on one side, Russia, on the other side, Pakistan and Afghanistan, Iran also, China increasingly as well. And within this context, Pakistan has been playing a pivotal role in terms of a country which has huge impact on Afghanistan and which is in itself hugely impacted by Afghanistan. In these 15 minutes, I'll try to answer three basic questions. First, whether Pakistan is ready to accept a negotiation on which it will have influence, but maybe not full control. Secondly, how the evolution of Pakistan's internal situation impacts its Afghan Taliban policy. And last but not the least, how situation in Afghanistan influences situation in Pakistan. The first question, straight away, whether Pakistan will accept a position where it will be able to influence but not manage, not micromanage or not control negotiations in Afghanistan. For this, I would invite you to think about Pakistan's mindset, especially the mindset of Pakistan's security establishment, which calls all the shots in this regard, and also the strategic culture within Pakistan. My understanding is that Pakistan yearns for recognition, yearns for recognition of its importance of its significance within the region. WikiLeaks has made um, our task a bit easier. Uh, for instance, there is this one report which was published, one cable, which I'll very briefly mention, which said that when Pakistan's Army Chief General Kiani was here as part of this mem member of the strategic dialogue that was taking place a few months ago, um, within that meeting, there was Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, President Obama walked in, and General Kiani was ready with his 12-pager, a brief of which has been published through WikiLeaks. He started off very clearly right from the word go. He said, well, our efforts in Afghanistan, meaning Pakistan's efforts or contribution within Afghanistan is not recognized. Uh, he said Pakistan's fight against extremists in federally administered tribal areas is not appreciated. He had a long list of his demands for Pakistan military. He also mentioned about Indian influence in Afghanistan. And it, it is no secret. Even without this WikiLeaks uh, revolution, we, we knew this. But the mindset is that Pakistan yearns for this recognition, and they want to be recognized as a very important player. There are two examples I'll provide for this. One is, I'll take you back, when Pakistan started off its nuclear weapons program. Uh, and also, the way they developed it the way after the 1998 tests Pakistan wanted that it should be recognized as a nuclear state. Uh, that, that is just one example. Secondly, from 2002 to 2003, um, Pakistan has consistently been saying, and this was also a well-known fact, though substantiated by the WikiLeaks, the fact was that Pakistan was always complaining that they have not been taken into confidence about what the U.S. role and what the U.S. plans are about Afghanistan. And um, 
in, in cables after cables and in various negotiations and conversations, the Pakistani leadership would always say this to the United States, well, we want to be your partners in knowing what is the actual plan. Now, the problem was that the United States itself was not aware what the plan was. But within Pakistan, it was seen as that there is some choreographed plan, there is some a larger model which U.S. is pursuing. There is a certain very clear objectives, and we are not taken into confidence. So this is, again, the mindset um, that Pakistan believes that its uh, complaints, its grievances have not been listened to. The second point uh, in this regard is whether Pakistan would accept a role, which, a role where it is not completely managing the situation, negotiations. In that regard, I think there is now increasing recognition within the Pakistan's military infrastructure uh, that peaceful Afghanistan is a necessity for Pakistan not only to progress but even to survive. Uh, yes, these recognitions take time to be converted into policy. It is not that just one fine morning you uh, realize about something, whether it is about uh, personal human relationships or whether it's about policy, even when you recognize that a certain mistake was committed or whether a certain new direction is needed, it takes time. And in countries like Pakistan, where there is dysfunction between different institutions, it is more obvious. So I think, yes, if Pakistan is seen or accepted or, or projected even within the negotiations as a very important stakeholder, they will play a role. Yes, they want to su support um, people like uh, Haqqani and some other groups, but it also needs to be recognized that they are fighting many other uh, militant groups in Bajor, in Oryx Agency, in the federally administered tribal areas. I'll come back to this issue later as well. The second uh, question about how evolution of the internal situation in Pakistan influences Pakistan's policy. Here also, I will again um, refer you to, uh, to the history. My argument is that whenever there was political instability in Pakistan, at that moment, its foreign policy objectives and its foreign policy um, mechanisms were to completely dysfunctional. Example, again, I have in mind is the nuclear proliferation issues related to Pakistan. Pakistan's relationship with Libya, North Korea, and Iran, um, I would argue there were six different small, there can be six different small case studies where Pakistan helped Iran twice, twice to North Korea, twice Libya. All those six episodes happened at a time when the civil military tension was at its peak, when uh, political instability was rising. So the argument is that if there is more political instability in Pakistan, the decision-making processes will become, become more blurred. From 2007 to 2010, the most critical period in, in Afghan policy in, in developments within Afghanistan, we saw fall of Musharraf, we saw or observed a rise in terrorist um, operations within Pakistan, and we also witnessed transition to democracy. Whenever transition to democracy takes place, whether in Pakistan or in Indonesia or in, in any other country, um, no one is very clear who's making the decisions. Though within Pakistan, it's Pakistan military, which, which plays the most significant role when it comes to decisions about India and Afghanistan. At times of political instability and tussle, a few generals, maybe the chief of army staff, and a couple of other people call all the shots. So, at this time, I would argue, Pakistan is coming out of that transition period where, of course, after Musharraf, transition to democracy is taking place. So with the passage of time, there is increasing possibility that Pakistan's policy towards Afghanistan will be streamlined more. And unlike the previous decades, where it was only between military and uh, civilians, now there are other important, powerful institutions which are calling the shots, Pakistan's judiciary. Pakistan's media. So um, there is every possibility that if this transition to democracy survives, and if you want to know anything more about this political instability and transition, again, look at the last um, three days of New York Times and, and see what the US ambassador was saying about uh, political tussles within Pakistan. Now coming to the last point uh, about impact of Afghanistan on Pakistan. I think it's huge. 
it is huge in social terms. It is huge in political terms, in economic terms as well. Uh, but what we often miss in all of this is that we often look at Pakistan's strategy toward Afghanistan from the lens of Pakistan military. Whereas um, a lot changed uh, within the Pashtun community, which lives in federally administered tribal areas in Pakistan's northwest, Pakistan's Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. Those changes, those transitions um, have played havoc in Pakistan. And there is a civil society response to that as well. The, the people, the Pashtuns also matter hugely. Uh, Pakistan army can call the shots, but there are these civil society actors, there is this public opinion that also plays a significant role. So in this larger picture, there are two or three things um, I think that we have missed in terms of uh, political analysis, in terms of international community, um, which is that Pakistan's capacity, that we generally believe to be the case, Pakistan's capacity to influence negotiations in Taliban, that is highly exaggerated. Um, I doubt very much, and I know this is a controversial point and this is open for discussion, uh, whether really Mullah Umar is the one who is calling all the shots, even if he's in Quetta or in Karachi or maybe in Islamabad, whether he's the one uh, who is leading this one hierarchical model where he is calling all the shots. Again, I refer to this um, new revelation. Um, the intelligence chief of, of Afghanistan, Mr. Swale or Saleh, um, in a 2009 cable, he said that the Pakistani military had reached out to the Afghan intelligence saying, this is exactly, I'm quoting from this cable, which is um, very credible and authentic. No one has challenged that. He said Pakistan offered them that we can help Afghan government to negotiate with Mullah Omar. And according to the intel intelligence chief of Afghanistan, it was uh, the US team when Afghans approached Americans. Uh, what do you think about this? Um, it, it was um, refused. It was, this offer was declined. Again, the point, I would argue, even if Pakistan is allowed to play the role of a bridge builder between Quetta Shura or Karachi Shura, whatever label we want to give it, whether that will really make a difference within Afghanistan? Um, I know other speakers have talked about and will talk about more about internal divisions in Afghanistan or the corruption or the lack of governance or um, lack of preparation in the Afghan military and the police, whether just bringing in Mullah Umar and two, three, four other people and arranging their meeting with Karzai with resolve all those issues, very unlikely. One model which, which we have totally forgotten about in this context is the model of uh, Geneva Accords. <coughs> That was a time in 1989 when the Soviet Union's fall was imminent. That was the time when Pakistan's military, led by a military dictator, General Ziaul Haq, was absolutely against having any negotiated deal with the so former Soviet Union. Despite that, the Prime Minister of the Times, Mr. Junejo, who was a person who was handpicked by, by Zia, he, along with his um, team, his foreign minister, signed um, Geneva Accords against the will of General Ziaul Haq. The argument I'm making here is that if there is a regional model, if United Nations is involved, then there is much more likelihood that Pakistan will sign on to a peace proposal, to a peace project, irrespective of whether Pakistan military or its leadership is completely on board or not. Um, so I, I think that is one model we, we must look at. I'm through with my 15 minutes. I would welcome questions on these issues later on. Thank you. Thanks, Hassan. Sammy. Okay. Here, <laughs> yep, you're next. All right. I'm going to talk about India and Afghanistan. I think most of us understand that India's activities in Afghanistan are in significant measure uh, driving the uh, shenanigans that, that Pakistan has been engaging in and which have been discussed throughout the morning. So I'm going to talk about India and what its interests are in Afghanistan. In the same way that it's important to understand Pakistan's strategic interests, I think we also have to understand India's strategic interests. And to really get some, sliver, well, to get some sliver of light into this problem, it's probably useful to also understand how, India's, how India conceives of, the, of its strategic environment. Raja Mohan has a, a really interesting way of framing this. He talks about India's strategic environment as three concentric circles. The first encompasses India's immediate neighborhood. 
in which India seeks primacy and veto power over all other outside powers, including the United States in some measure. United, India has been deeply vexed with the United States over recent years, and obviously it was deeply vexed, although quietly, when the Russians invaded Afghanistan. In the second sphere, which encompasses the so-called extended neighborhood, which, stretch, which stretches across Asia, the Indian Ocean littoral, India seeks uh, to be a balancer of influence of other powers and to prevent those powers from undercutting India's interests. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what this middle range looks like, because if you look at other Indian analysts, they map out um, a middle ground for India's strategic interests in really capacious geographical terms. When I was doing some work uh, on the Indian Army, looking at U.S. Army, uh, U.S. Indian uh, Army cooperation, a number of analysts laid it out like this. That their strategic backyard stretches from the eastern littoral of Africa, going all the way to the Strait of Malacca. To the south, it goes to Antarctica. To the north, it includes all of Central Asia, and obviously the Gulf, the Strait of Hormuz. And they would summarize this view as they call it the Indian Ocean for a reason. And in the third um, concentric circle that Indian strategists identify, it's the global stage. And this is where you see India being very active in recent years, lobbying for a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. India's had a prominent role, one can debate whether positive or negative, at Doha, climate change. And increasingly, India seeks a role in managing the global commons, be it maritime or be it cyberspace. So India is really chomping at the bit to be seen as others, as a state with power and influence far beyond that of South Asia. And what you've seen it trying to do, certainly since 2000, but certainly since President Bush came into power and, and saw creating a strategic relationship with India as central to U.S. interests, India has been struggling very hard to sort of cast off the Pakistan albatross. And this is, in some ways, reciprocated on the U.S. side by the promulgation of the policy called dehyphenization, which is that the U.S. will pursue a relation with India as well as Pakistan without regard, how else, how, howsoever fanciful that might be, to their security competition. So we want to see India become a global power. India wants to be a global power. And for India to be that, it has to be, it has to extract itself from these parochial conflicts in South Asia. Yet, of course, India has no real strategy to deal with Pakistan. So this, this makes a paradox for India achieving its aims, and it also frustrates and undermines U.S. efforts to engage South Asia in a way that consistently put forward our national security interests. So when we talk about India and Afghanistan, it's important to realize that it's a part of India's overall strategy to be seen as an important player extra-regionally, but also globally. So in, in recent years, you will hear India complaining that it hasn't had an appropriate seat at the table, that it's been excluded in negotiations about Afghanistan, largely out of concern or deference to Pakistan's equities. So you'll see India jockeying for greater influence in Afghanistan, and it will constantly lament that it had always been excluded from any process of bringing peace to Afghanistan. While there is absolute certitude that India's interests in Afghanistan are part of its extra-regional and indeed global aspirations to, to have a seat at the table in managing um, international security, we also can't fool ourselves that there's also a deeply Pakistan-specific set of interests uh, in its activities in Afghanistan. So if we were to, I, when I think about India and Afghanistan, I, I think of generally three objectives, and we can sort of quibble um, about ones that I've left out or even if they're fair. But the first one goes back to India's hardcore security interests. I think it's sometimes easy to forget when we're talking about Afghanistan that most of the militant groups which ravage India today had their origins in one way or another in the jihadi production function that came out of the 1980s in the camps in Afghanistan. And obviously the active use of those groups by the ISI is a part of Pakistan's management of its external security concerns. So India is going to be supremely 
am preeminently interested that Afghanistan does not again become a safe haven for terrorist groups operating against it. From the Indian point of view, it has enough to deal with. Just dealing with Pakistan is a sanctuary. And some of you may remember the Indian Airlines hijacking that occurred, was it 1990, Eight. December 98? Eight. Yeah, December 98. Uh, that was an effort to get Masood Hazar and other nefarious associates out of an Indian jail. And when that aircraft finally came to a land in January of 1999, Masood Azhar and his associates um, stepped out of the aircraft in Kandahar and were transported complements of the ISI transportation services to Pakistan. And within months, he appeared, actually I think it was in, within weeks, take, take that back, appeared in Karachi where he was announcing the formation of a new group, Jaish Muhammad. And it was Jaish Muhammad that in December 2001 attacked the Indian parliament, setting off the largest mobilization of military forces on both sides since the, 1990, the 1971 war. The difference being is that this was now taking place in a nuclear environment. So if you're India, you understand very clearly that Afghanistan is not something that you can afford to be insouciant about, even if you have relatively few instruments at your disposal to manage uh, that particular objective. The second objective, which in some measure relates closely to the first, is that it wants to retain Afghanistan as a friendly state. Um, this is a somewhat softer version of what Pakistan seeks in Afghanistan, which is a client state or an extended backyard from which it can manage other aspects of its external security policy. The third objective is something that I think very few people really appreciate, and it's even more so tied to the first, and that is the impact on India's domestic policies coming out of what happens in Afghanistan. So, for those of you that know stuff about India, you have a very unpleasant synergy that has developed in recent years. On the one hand, you have a robust, thriving Hindu nationalism with an increasingly nasty, militant offshoot. They are growing in response synergistically to an evolving domestic Islamist terrorism problem in India that has absolutely nothing to do with Kashmir. It has a lot more to do with how much it sucks to be a Muslim in India. So whenever some Islamist militant associated with the Indian Mujahideen blows up something in India, there's always a fear that there's going to be a responding action by a militant group associated with a Hindu group, and vice versa. So these two trends are very much negatively and mutually reinforcing each other. And India has been in considerable denial about the, domestic the domestication of Islamist militancy. It's no longer about Pakistan. You can take Pakistan out of the equation, and now you have the Indian Mujahideen. And it has its own logic. So when I look at some of the Indian Mujahideen videos that I have, they're actually strategically outbidding some of the leftist groups. So if you look at some of the Indian Mujahideen recruitment literature that's coming out of the east of India, they'll say to their, to their Muslim market, yes, the Maoists are right. It really does suck to be you. But they're wrong in their diagnosis because they are a bunch of atheist coffeeers who are going to burn in hell. So they're strategically and competitively outbidding the leftists to capture the aggregated outrage of, of, some of, these, of, of some of these individuals. I actually had the chance to go to Cheetah Camp in Mumbai in April. And when you're cruising around Cheetah Camp, you generally understand why we're seeing these, uh, the, the development of these pockets of Indian Islamist Mujahid elements. So India is very keen in trying to synthesize all of these regional concerns, yet it's ultimately constrained by, it, by the fact that it doesn't have a tremendous number of tools uh, in the box to achieve these very capacious goals. Now, India has, is not new to Afghanistan. I think when, when Pakistanis, and I'm sympathetic to their claims, but when Pakistan talks about the mushrooming consulates, they, they give the impression that somehow India's presence in Afghanistan is new. And of course, that's not true at all. Um, India signed a friendship treaty with Afghanistan in 1950. It, uh, during King Zahir Shah's period, had hundreds of advisors. In fact, Pakistan is very fearful um, when it looks around and it sees all of the Indians that are presently in the Karzai government in a variety of capacities, even though different organizations might be paying their check. So Pakistan wants to be sure that 
there is not a return to the time of Zahir Shah when India was, was basically in the back in, in Pakistan's narrative running the show or helping Zahir Shah run a show in a way that was detrimental to Pakistan's interest. During the 1980s, India was, you would have thought, India would have been marginalized as Afghanistan and as Saudi Arabia, uh, of course with US money, uh, were running the show in Afghanistan. But it's actually surprising. During the anti-Soviet jihad, India actually expanded its development activities. And this should give you some sense of the tenacity with which India views uh, its, its goals and objectives in Afghanistan, how important they are. As you know, after the, uh, the Soviet jihad ended and we entered uh, the warlord period, at the same time we had the dissolution of the Soviet Union and all the Central Asian republics opened up. Pakistan and Afghanistan also began jockeying for influence in that region. Both of them largely failed, albeit for reasons that were quite different. Neither of them managed to achieve the, the sort of depth and political clout that they wanted to achieve in that area. After the Taliban's consolidation of power, India still did not let go. Although the Indian area of influence was largely localized uh, to helping the Northern Alliance, from the Pakistan optic, what they did was actually really quite important. So they had a military advisor at the level of the brigadier. In fact, I met one of the Indian brigadiers that was the military, uh, that was one of the military advisors uh, to the Northern Alliance. Ra also has a covert aviation wing. Uh, Ra, uh, using that covert aviation wing, provided uh, helicopter and other aviation assistance, maintenance to the Northern Alliance. The Indians did much of this from a base in Tajikistan, Fokar Aini. It's really difficult to understand what's going on there because the reporting on it is so confused and it's ultimately contradictory. But when Emma Shah Massoud was blown up in the suicide attack, some of you may or may not know, that he was actually evacuated by helicopter and he actually died at Fokar Aini. So let's go back to 2001 when we were seeking Musharraf's cooperation about the way in which Afghanistan would be invaded and how Kabul would eventually fall. Musharraf was adamant that the Northern Alliance not take Kabul. Yet, having been at, at that time at the Bland Corporation, we were sort of sucked into writing articles and papers about a post-Taliban Afghanistan. No one understood that from Pakistan's point of view, when we let the Northern Alliance come in, it was tantamount to giving India the keys. No one adequately understood that from Pakistan's optic, the Northern Alliance was an Indian proxy. So when Kabul fell, thanks to the Northern Alliance, it was basically Indian proxies defeating that of Pakistan. And I, I, I think I, I have convinced myself over the years that that was probably one of the most important strategic errors and a concatenation of errors that has largely brought about the Pakistan position on Afghanistan with which we are trying to deal today. And, and as a matter of fact, which make it almost impossible to change in any significant way Pakistan's cost-benefit calculus. Since 2001, under our security umbrella, because India, like many countries, is a free rider under our security umbrella, India has been able to establish a number of what it will call development projects. India is very proud of the large amount of resources it has put into Afghanistan. But some of the things that India has done have, have not actually been all that helpful from the point of view of regional stability. So globally, what India has done might have been helpful for Afghans. But in terms of antagonizing some of the regional dynamics that are and have been at play, some of the things have been less helpful. In fact, ultimately, Karzai is responsible so, uh, for, for being unable to manage these relationships more, more aptly. One of the most interesting things, of course, uh, was building um, a part of the ring road in the south with the Border Roads Organization. For those of you who don't know what the Border Roads Organization is, I guess the best similarity might be to compare it to the um, Army Corps of Engineers. If you go to their website, they describe themselves as being um, a strategic arm of the Indian Army, so the Pakistanis are not crazy when they say that you know, there's an Indian military presence in Afghanistan. It's especially not crazy when you look at the fact that the civilian contractors building the ring road under the border roads organization, when they came under attack, India's response was to bring the Indo-Tibetan police force. 
supplemented with Army commandos. I know this because I also met an Indian brigadier who told me how they were squeezing in Army commandos under the guise of the Indo-Tibetan police force. The other thing that India has done, which has been problematic from Pakistan's point of view, is its cooperation with Iran. So Iran is, again, part of India's larger strategy to be an extra-regional player. Iran is absolutely pivotal to India's ability to operate in Afghanistan for the obvious reason that Pakistan won't let it through. And Iran is also an important gateway state so that India can project its influence in a number of ways into Central Asia. They have a, a, a north-south corridor which will allow India to move goods up and through Tehran, or up, up and through Iran and then go to the Caspian and then have distribution routes elsewhere. Central to this has been the building of a port called Chabahar. Chabahar is just a few uh, hundred kilometers along the Macron coast from the Gwadar port, which the Chinese are building in Pakistan. So remember the logic of Gwadar port was to provide the shortest route possible from Central Asia to the Arabian Sea. Problem is only a fool would actually trust that particular G-lock because for <laughs> who in the hell is going to move stuff from Gwadar up through Fatah? I mean, give me a break. So obviously Chabahar has permanently, unless you're a complete lunatic, uh, you might have a different view, but Chabahar has basically become the shortest route linking Central Asia and, and every other venue in that, in that general vicinity to, in fact, the sea. So this has been very frustrating for Pakistan because they also believe that the Iranians and the Indians are up to military nonsense in Chabahar. And there's some evidence for this because you know, there have been some Indian naval activity going on at Chabahar. So if you're Pakistan, just sort of, I like to say, let's put our Pakistan goggles on. So you look, to the, you look to Iran and you see a strategic relationship with India developing that's endured some pretty crazy stuff. And let, you know, let's put this into context. India has managed excellent relations with the United States, Israel, and Iran simultaneously, even against the backdrop of, of Iran massively trying to aspire to the proliferation benchmark set by Pakistan. Then you have India's presence in Afghanistan, which you know, I've been talking about the last 10 minutes, you know, he rehearsed that. Um, even India's relationship with China is slowly but surely changing as China begins to appreciate and has begun to appreciate the problems that Pakistan's internal as well as external uh, policies pose to, to China. So if you're Pakistan, your world looks pretty nastier, and it gets nastier with every passing month. So when we, when we think about how Pakistan could be riled up that Karzai is is giving assistance to a few ethnic Baluch that might blow up some stuff in Quetta, and we say, how in the world can they be so incensed about this? It's so minor compared to what you do. When you put it from the point of view of the Pakistani state and the ISI, you see it's a, it's, it's a much bigger pitch, picture than Karzai just giving, you know, some, uh, I don't know, some roops and some explosives and using the NDS in Kandahar to pass that on to Baluch nationalists. So, in conclusion, good. yeah. Sounds good. Sounds so, in good. conclusion, sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds no, no, great. hey, sounds dude, I'm right sounds on good. you. That's good. That's great. That's great. So, so India, like everyone else, is sort of hedging its bets based upon what happens at first in 2011 and now potentially 2014. And some of the most interesting debates have actually happened in this context because India, for for so long, had really been in this Nehruvian pass as sort of our foreign policy is moral, we're good because we're good. Well, India is now woken up and has become hardcore realist capital R. And it no longer wants to be a passive witness to what happens. It wants to be more active and proactive in, in managing what's going on in its region. So for the first time, you have real live Indian hawks that are saying things like, we should send a division of troops to Afghanistan. Okay, this is absolutely unheard of after India got its butt kicked in Sri Lanka. So the fact that you even have this discussion is something that we should really ponder, even if it's asymptotically careening into zero in terms of probability. At the other extreme, you have those who say, Afghanistan is too important to simply walk away from. We should boost our diplomatic security, but let's stop being pussies about it and give our diplomatic presence some security. You know, if you go to Kandahar, you'll see this little puny consulate, they have no security. Then at the other extreme, you'll have people who say, kind of like many Americans are saying, we're really paying a lot of cost for this and we're not seeing a benefit and that we should just get the hell out when the Americans leave. So I'll leave it like this. Um, India, like every other of the near and far neighbor in Afghanistan, are hedging their bets, 
trying to maximize what they can get, minimize the risk exposure, but ultimately they're coming up with contingency plans based upon what they think we will or will not do in either 2011 or 2014. Thanks, Thanks Christine. Joshua? Okay, so I um, kind of need to start out by uh, distancing myself a little bit from uh, my name in the program. I'm not actually here representing my employer in any way. Uh, so just had to get that out of the way. I know it's kind of weird to bring up. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a region that most people normally don't even think of when it comes to discussing Afghanistan, and that's the post-Soviet Central Asia states. Uh, I think with good reason, people tend to focus on Iran, China, Pakistan, and India when it comes to understanding where Afghanistan fits in Central and South Asia. But part of Central and South Asia is actual Central Asia. Uh, and so in that context, focusing on these states is important in a lot of ways because they will have a role to play kind of just by design, by geography. They're going to have some kind of role in Afghanistan in the future. But not a lot of people, uh, first of all, understand the region at all, much less understand that region's relationship to Afghanistan. So I'm going to lay out a couple of broad themes uh, without much detail because there's no time for it. But these, I hope at least, will help contextualize how these states are aligning themselves or not aligning themselves, as it were, and then what those implications might mean moving forward. So one of the first things to understand with Central Asia and Afghanistan is that there's a very significant clash of interests between the governments of Central Asia and then all of the other regional players in Afghanistan. I think you would be hard pressed to find any official in any, I call them the stands, in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, any of them who has really strong opinions one way or another about the ultimate government of Afghanistan. Uh, for all intents and purposes, they don't care. What they care about is how events within Afghanistan affect their own kind of roiling domestic crises. The two countries where this is the most important right now are Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, both of which have had decades now of problems stemming from political dissidents and Islamic militants teaming up to create either a quasi-civil war situation in Uzbekistan in the Fergana Valley or an actual civil war in Tajikistan, which killed an ungodly number of people and then sort of fizzled out in the uh, late 90s. So related to this clash of interests, it's, it, it's not just that militarism is a problem or that dissidents or opposition is a problem. There's also a fundamental uh, economic issue at stake as well. Uh, Kyrgyzstan gets a lot of the attention in this sense because of the wrangling that they've had over the Manas Air Base. Uzbekistan sometimes comes in for consideration in this with the Karshi Khanabad Air Base that they eventually booted the United States out of. But there are also broader regional economic and trade issues at well that have a lot to do with Afghanistan. I mean, Christine talked a little bit about how both Gwadar and Chabahar are figuring into these calculations of moving goods into and out of Central Asia through these ports along the southern coast. But one of the most important exports out of Central Asia is energy. And I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can speak for people here. Like, there, there, there's absolutely no indication that anyone is fighting a war in Afghanistan for oil. Like, Christine said, you would have to be insane to think that that is a reliable way to export anything of value. But what Central Asia has managed to do, Kazakhstan in particular, is to team up with China to develop non-Russian alternatives to energy exports in a way that has effectively boxed the United States out of the region. For the last 15 years or so, a conglomeration of American companies have been trying to build a pipe called Nabucco, which would be exporting uh, essentially natural gas and oil underneath the Caspian Sea, west from Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, and it has completely fizzled out. Uh, there is almost no impetus for it anymore, even though some European countries fearing Russian energy domination have tried to edge in on it ever since China managed to complete eastward flowing pipes out of Kazakhstan. The idea of exporting energy west out of Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan is almost a dead issue now. So what you see is, to a limited extent, and this is a very limited extent because again, I don't see any evidence that Kazakhstan considers Afghanistan or as a proxy to that American interest in the region as an overriding concern. But you see Kazakhstan in particular trying to balance diplomatic moves by the United States against much more important, to them at least, diplomatic moves from China. 
And it's turning into a very interesting and frankly complex balance of power arrangement in terms of how people are orienting themselves in the energy export market and then also in uh, trade export markets as well. So into all of this mix, uh, kind of at the end of 2008 comes this thing called the Northern Distribution Network. And this is a series of bilateral transit agreements that the United States inked with both the governments of Central Asia and Russia uh, and Georgia and Turkey and I think Lithuania and probably some other transit states to move supplies for the Afghanistan war from either the Baltic Sea or from the Black Sea across Russia and across Central Asia and into northern Afghanistan. This is essentially co-opting the old supply lines that the Soviets used during their war. And they're doing this in response to a series of ongoing attacks against supply con convoys traveling from Karachi north into Afghanistan. So this is their attempt to, uh, to adopt to a rapidly changing security environment within northwest Pakistan by essentially co-opting the Soviet Union's old supply lines through Central Asia. Now, this has had several effects throughout the region, all of which factor into these countries' calculations about how they consider Afghanistan and how they plan their relationships with the different regional stakeholders within, uh, related to Afghanistan. The biggest one is, I think at least, corruption. And this is something that no one inside Central Asia actually enjoys talking about very much. But as the NDN has come online, as you've seen this enormous growth in supplies transiting through Russia, in particular, you've also seen a growth in organized crime. And this was already a problem, in particular around Manas, where the entire operations of that base are essentially run by gangs, by crime lords. The issue of crime in Kyrgyzstan has already led to the downfall, more or less, of two governments. It's rapidly destabilizing the current interim government over Rozo Tunbayeva, and there's no indication that the United States is willing to moderate its reliance on these criminal networks in order to supply both its bases and to operate the supply lines that move into Afghanistan. In addition, the NDN has also been an enormous uh, economic boon to the governor of Balkh province, a guy named uh, Nur Mohammed Atta. He, there, this is something else that no one really enjoys discussing publicly because he's not normally associated as a malign actor in northern Afghanistan. Uh, he is not particularly known for cooperating with anyone that we would consider to be an outright threat there. However, his family has mysteriously become outrageously wealthy the moment supplies begin moving through Termez and being distributed from Mazari Sharif. So there is most likely some kind of flow of corrupt money or corrupt practices from this alliance of transit corridors that the United States negotiated in Central Asia and into northern Afghanistan. Uh, kind of flipping sides, so what would, what would the states in Central Asia kind of fear from Afghanistan? They've, they're able to extract a great deal of money both from the United States, China, and Russia uh, for transit agreements, but what would they actually fear from the area? The biggest issue would be internal revolt or internal dissidence. There's a number of stories, I, I, I'm not sure why there's a cluster of them right now, but in, in several magazines and newspapers there's been an uptick in uh, stories about Islamism in Tajikistan. And there is a lot of speculation now that this is an outflow from Taliban militants escaping the super successful war in Afghanistan and relocating into Tajikistan <laughs> and destabilizing elements there. And there's some, el there's some evidence that there's cooperation between militant groups in these areas, but there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever to support that this is an expansion of the Taliban's area of influence, that these militants operating in Tajikistan have ambitions even for anything other than uh, gaining autonomy to run their old corrupt criminal networks again. But this is a concern. Uh, around this time last year, uh, surprisingly high-placed high U.S. official actually told me that he was, in his words, scared shitless by what's happening in central Tajikistan. And he was saying this because of a single firefight in which three Tajik police officers got killed and about 20 gangsters got killed. 
And I mean, it, it's it's significant. That's a big deal. But there's no reason to assume that the end of the world is happening. But because some of these people used to be associated with Tajikistan's Islamist parties, and because some of them have purchased opium or transited opium for criminals who may or may not have had ties to certain Taliban commanders, this is now evidence of some pan-regional Islamist movement or something. Uh, I don't think that's really a fair characterization of what's going on. For the most part in Tajikistan, uh, resistance carries the rhetoric of Islamism, but in action and even in beliefs of most individual fighters, there's almost no evidence that these people use Islamism or use a Taliban-like ideology to push what they do. You see a lot of the same thing in Uzbekistan as well. Uzbeks are kind of, Uzbeks and Chechens are kind of the boogeymen of Central Asia. Uh, whenever you want to talk about someone scary, uh, you either call them a Chechen or call them an Uzbek. Uh, and, I mean, for the Uzbeks, there's a, a somewhat accurate reason for doing this. One of the more infamous Islamist networks in the area is the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, which was originally organized as a resistance movement against Islam Karimov's government in the uh, mid-90s. The challenge with using these as this canard for explaining why magical bad things happen is that they don't really do a whole lot. Uh, one of the major groups that... Uh, groups like the, the Jamestown Foundation write about is the significant global players in uh, jihad is the Islamic Jihad Union, which is an, off, an offshoot of the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. And near as I can tell, the only thing that they may have done is set off a bomb in Tashkent in 2004. And other than that, they're rumored to be headquartered somewhere in the federally administered tribal areas of Pakistan. Occasionally, they're uh, members who are either German or Turkish citizens who speak Turkish and none of the local languages are arrested in places like Germany for doing things. But there's no real tie into these areas. But they still dominate a lot of the official and policy discussions of Central Asian militia groups operating in Afghanistan and in Pakistan and serving these destabilizing functions. But again, there's very little evidence that they actually do anything beyond say really mean things on the internet about Jews and Afghans. So. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, I, I guess kind of the theme that I'm pulling out of this is there's a lot of fear-mongering about the negative influences that either Central Asia can be having on Afghanistan or that activities and movements within Afghanistan can be having on Central Asia, but there's no, there's no evidence that this is actually happening on a level beyond people talking about it. And talk does have value, but it really doesn't have all that much value at the end of the day. Uh, Lastly, one of the things that, that I want to mention with all of this is that when, when we talk about these issues and we talk about the problem that Islamic resistance movements play, that different uh, un politically unpopular trade agreements pay, play or that energy export routes play, is that there are very structural, almost foundational explanations for why this happens. There's a tendency, at least within the United States foreign policy community, right now at least, to wrap things up in these ideas of ideology and movements and ideas. But when you look at why these states make the decisions that they do, so when you, when you think about why uh, Kyrgyzstan rejected China's offer to purchase Manas Air Base for $3 billion, or why they rejected Russia's offer to purchase Manas Air Base for $2 billion, and decided instead to go with the United States' annual, I think, $180 million rent, uh, there, there are broader reasons for that besides either them preferring American influence to any of these other people or some kind of pro-Western ideology or even anti-Western ideology behind it. Um, and I'm actually running out of time to be discussing this. Uh, you can see the same thing with Tajikistan. So say why Rahman's government doesn't take a more aggressive stance against these people operating in the Rasht Valley. Uh, Frankly, they don't pose much of a threat to his regime. He's, he's very, I mean, I think this is a common element both in India and in Pakistan, that they're, they're eager to use American largesse to fight battles that they want to fight. But ultimately, if they don't have much of a stake in the matter, they're not really going to fight them to completion. I think you see this definitely in Uzbekistan and in Tajikistan, where these governments essentially abuse American uh, gullibility. Well, uh, I should probably rephrase that. If... Uh, <laughs> If, if a government official in Uzbekistan or in Tajikistan screams Islamism loudly enough, they will get essentially an unlimited blank check to go address the problem. And you see this pattern repeated all the time, almost on a yearly basis, whenever 
each government is facing a domestic concern that they feel they can't face, or if they're facing a cash shortfall because they've accidentally stolen too much money into their Swiss bank accounts, they immediately cry out Islamism, or you very conveniently see a bombing go off somewhere that doesn't affect the government in any way and doesn't do anything beyond create a news bite on the BBC, and then suddenly they're getting checks for millions of dollars and promises of security assistance from the United States. So I guess I'll leave kind of that embarrassingly bad picture of what the region is like, uh, and we can, I guess, talk about it more in questions. Thanks, Joshua. We've got, um, uh, we got half an hour, and I guess you finally came on to the common theme that um, sort of, uh, cuts across the, the region that we've been looking at, um, the uh, willingness to, uh, to cry the Islamic, uh, the Islamic <laughs> threat is undermining us. Help, please. Um, uh, we got half an hour. I think, the, I think the format earlier on worked best of having uh, three at a time. Uh, anybody want to come, uh, come up with your questions? Yeah, please go ahead. Christine, go ahead and wait for the others to get ready. All right. So, um, I don't. I won't. I don't think it's fair to call it divide and conquer. I think there is this idea that, and, and this is actually best articulated in a piece that Ashley Tellis wrote in 2005, who was also the architect of the Indo-U.S. nuclear deal. As Ashley lays it out, I, and I think it's point. I think it's fair to reference him because he has really been the proponent of this, and he's you know very influential in getting these various policies pushed forward, especially under the Bush administration. The way he laid it out was like this: India has a natural set of aspirations in the region. India and China are natural competitors, and they are. So you'll see. India and China necking it out in Burma. You'll see them fighting it over um, natural gas in Iran, even though Iran has no LNG capability. So fighting over LNG seems kind of silly. So you'll see India and China competing, for example, they, they, they both want to be small arms providers. So Ashley's argument and those that, that buy into it said that by helping India become the power that it wants to be, and since India has much more in common in terms of the way it sees the world and the way it, it sees its security threats with the U.S. than anyone else in the region, that India, by virtue of doing what it wants to do, will prevent China from consolidating hegemony over the region. So this isn't about dividing and conquering. It's about helping India do what India wants to do best, and that is establish its own source of preeminence. And this was why the Indo-U.S. nuclear deal was so important. Ambassador Blackwell, in the same document that I, I mentioned that I actually wrote in 2005, says, why is it that China can have uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles and a robust nuclear program, but we deny India the same? And in that document, they even laid out the logic of, of helping India's nuclear program. So I don't think it's about divide and conquer. I, I think it's about helping India do what India would ordinarily do in a longer time horizon in ways that ultimately serve our purposes. You can disagree with that or agree with it, but I, I don't think the logic is strictly speaking divide and conquer. And, it, and it's also both India and the United States, they have a complex relationship with China. It, it's, it's really about managing, the, it's about managing a strategic competition under uncertainty. We don't really know what China wants to do. We can only see what China is doing. So we can't divine intention from its military modernization, but we can probably assume that they're not develop developing capabilities for no good reason. So it's also about managing the rise of China in a collectivist way. Can I trouble you to come up to the mic, please? Um, and anybody else who's keen, you can follow. And perhaps you'd introduce yourself as well. Hi, Michael Cohen. Um, so, one of the, uh, when you reach out to sort of proponents of the current uh, escalation in Afghanistan, there's sort of three arguments that are used to explain why we're there. One is sort of obviously Al Qaeda, two is, is obviously to stabilize Pakistan. And the third one, when those two sort of are, are fall, fall apart, the third one is always if we leave, the whole region will sort of become unstable. Afghanistan will become sort of a, a, a 
location for sort of a proxy war between various uh, actors in the region. And I guess the, the question I'm, I'm curious to hear is, is if how realistic is that notion that if we leave, the, sort of the, the whole region will fall apart, Afghanistan will become the, the focal point of this proxy war. And even if that is a threat, what should the U.S. be doing to prepare against that possibility? Well, I'm, I, I can address, I think, part of that. Uh, in the late 90s, um, Mullah Omar was actually quoted as saying that he, he had plans to move the Taliban movement north from Afghanistan and to take over the rest of Central Asia. That was originally why he teamed up with uh, Juma Namangani, who was the leader of the IMU at the time in, in 1998, I think. Uh, so, I mean, in, in, in the 90s, I think that was a legitimate concern. Um, I am not convinced that Omar carries that same ambition anymore. Uh, I, I, I would assume that, and I'm, I'm speaking entirely out of my ass on this, but I would assume that Omar has learned a lesson that announcing his intent to become a regional agent of instability is a very bad thing for his power and for his influence. Uh, as, as far as what Afghanistan itself would turn into, I mean, leaving it as kind of a contested or an uncontrolled space is bad, and it will carry a lot of effects. I think it's up in the air what that'll actually mean, though. Uh, my suspicion would be that Uzbekistan would get over its objection to American influence really quickly if that happened. Uh, if you were to listen to people like Fred Starr uh, from SAIS, he would actually say that one of the new reasons to be in Afghanistan is to pave it so that we can use Central Asia to transit goods to the Arabian Sea and have a grand mercantilist empire and be prosperous again. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, I, I think you're getting at something in that there's a great deal of ambiguity of what actually will happen or what real justifications are in that context for staying there. But, I mean, it's a cop-out, but I don't really have an answer beyond that. Hassan, I think you're coming in there. Yes. <clears throat> I would argue that, in fact, uh, one of the three things that you mentioned, um, that one of the objectives is of U.S. presence there is to stabilize Pakistan. Um, actually, that has not happened. And that was not expected to happen. Um, look at the history of the region since 2001. Um, number one, from Pakistan's internal point of view, Musharraf, a military dictator, got a new lease of life. Um, secondly, uh, the militants in Pakistan of various kinds, lashkar e taiba and Jaish Muhammad, the, those who focus on Kashmir on one side, and Afghan uh, Taliban or Pakistani Taliban especially, uh, with the combination getting support from all the other places from within Pakistan, as a second uh, militant uh, uh, reality, they got more entrenched, um, they got more aggressive, their logistical support improved, their coordination, their linkages between the Pakistani militant groups increased. So this has not improved Pakistan's stability, nor it will. Um, I will also argue that this analysis has nothing to do with the scenario in Afghanistan today, that yes, if U.S. leaves it completely, um, there will be more crisis, but purely uh, from looking from Pakistan's lens, I think the Pakistani Taliban uh, then will start moving towards Afghanistan. The new linkages and coordination and new resources that uh, Pakistani militants who are focused on Kashmir, what they have assumed and acquired in these years, will also see a uh, movement of Pakistani militant groups to again towards Kashmir possibly. So yes, if U.S. leaves it now, um, they will be um, battle within Afghanistan between Pakistan and Indian interests. But uh, we can also see that the Indian intelligence and Pakistani intelligence, they are already fighting in Afghanistan. Um, there are so many... Uh, attacks taking place within Kabul and elsewhere where you can find at least um, linkages with, with the Pakistani intelligence. So the point is that um, th this argument that U.S. is in Afghanistan because this in some way will stabilize Pakistan, is, I'm, uh, I think all the evidence uh, proves um, otherwise. I, I want to pick up on this briefly. Um, so I was in, uh, in Pakistan all summer, and one of the so you all sitting here, you, you would be saying, well, Pakistan is having its own internal security challenges. It has the Pakistani Taliban. Boy, it should be understanding its primary security threat is now internal. But you would all be very, very wrong. Because if you are a Pakistani, you believe that every single attack is actually done by an Indian agent. So even the attack that was done in Lahore against Dr. Gun and I was actually in Lahore when this went down. 
Within the early two hours of the attack, oh, maybe it's Lushkar Jungvi, which of course it was. But by the end of the day, the ISI PSYOP campaign had already filtered out. And by the end of the day, everyone believed it was India. So here's actually the perversion. Not only is Hassan Abbas right, because of what we did in Afghanistan and how we did it, and the way in which we had the Pakistanis engage, despite the fact that they were just as clueless about Fatah as we were, and it spawned a greater domestic challenge for Pakistan, it actually reinforces their narrative that their biggest threat is conventional in India. It actually has not motivated them in any way, shape, or form. And those of you who think that the army is going to reorient to a counterinsurgency pot, I would like to know what you're smoking and please pass them at dinner. Because what they have concluded from this, it, this is a further <coughs> rarification of an external threat, which gives ever more justification for the continued accumulation of a military buildup against India. It is, and it's so detrimental not only between the AFPAC situation, but in terms of the entire regional balance and the way a deeply dissatisfied anti-status quo state with nuclear weapons is going to deal with its neighborhood. It's not a pretty picture. My clear so file just add one thing to it. Why, 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 you, why you warm up, get ready for this really, really <laughs> tough question <laughs> right there. While agreeing uh, with Christian, I'll just add that recently there has been this much transition that I would say there are three major groups in Pakistan and that the way they interpret what is happening within Pakistan. One group certainly thinks Everything is coming from India. There's no doubt. But I think the support uh, of that group is declining. Secondly, there's a group which has now increasingly think that uh, what is happening in Pakistan is a product of Pakistan's own mistakes and blunders and, uh, and um, so many of the inadequacies. This group support is increasing. There's a third group which blames everything or yeah. most of these attacks on Blackwater and on United right. States. On yeah. <laughs> okay, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, Todd Greentree, I introduced myself. <coughs> um, the, um, so I, I become convinced that the, the central, one of the central issues here that we're dealing with, whether it's Afghanistan, our relations with India, uh, whether what our role is with Pakistan, is that the, the U.S. Um, has, frankly has not come to grips with the question of whether we're serious about this part of the world or not. Um, and, and that's why we bounce between these alternatives of you know, committing 100,000 troops plus or going to the Biden option. Um, I'd say if we're serious, then let's get serious. That's what, what this discussion hovers around. Um, and if we're, gonna, if we're not going to be, let's pull out and then be prepared to pay the consequences because there will be consequences to pay. So uh, sort of with that, let me uh, invite your speculation about what it might really mean for the, the United States and then all the alliance implications it implies to take this region seriously. What would a global security architecture look like? And, and for example, just to expand on what you were talking about in, in the first part about um, Indian interests in Afghanistan, which in many ways are fundamentally aligned with U.S. interests in, the, in a general sense, how, how would you bring that to bear? What would a global security architecture look like in this part of the world? <laughs> in uh, 15 seconds? <laughs> well, Go ahead. I, I, I think you could actually start that by looking north. Uh, this year we have seen the return of Russian troops to Afghanistan. Uh, and that's part of this reset that happened under the Obama administration, was trying to rebuild our relationship with Russia that uh, had more or less fallen apart over the war in Georgia. Uh, but what you see there, by and large, is America abdicating its role, at least in the northern section of this region. Uh, what I mentioned earlier about several western-facing energy routes essentially falling off the table, I, I think that's part of it. Um, it took, I think, either close to a year or well over a year to nominate a an ambassador to Azerbaijan. Uh, there had been an empty slot for a special State Department representative for Central Asia for I forgot how long. Uh, it just was never a priority for either the Bush or the Obama administrations to take at least Central Asia itself seriously. And when you take a region that has three states that can comprise the northern part of a war that you're sinking a hundred billion dollars a year into, when you just don't take that seriously, I think that might speak towards a larger issue that the region itself has very little long-term, at least people think the region has very little long-term strategic value. 
I would just add uh, very briefly when you have mentioned global security structure. Um, I think all the various options have been tested, um, though we are not sure about the intricacies or details of each of those. But in the last 10 years and even previous to that, uh, in the 10 years when we left Afghanistan to, its, uh, to, to, to the region, we saw what happened. Now U.S. has attempted. 10 years is a long period. United States has really uh, used all its analysis, all, it, all its money, whether it was military surge or it was development money. Various things have been attempted. I think, that, frankly, we, we must admit uh, most of those or almost all of those failed. I think if there has to be a global security um, formula or structure, which there should be, because Afghanistan is not a lost cause by any, um, by, uh, by any stretch of imagination. But for this global security uh, structure, we need United Nations. More countries, what will be the uh, one consequence of that? You will be able to say to Pakistan or to Central Asia or to India that this was what was decided upon. Any country which there will be evidence has not abided by the uh, final decisions of a UN body, they, the carrots and sticks should be used. You can go for your, uh, sanctions also. So there has to be a global consensus. Um, what is the, after all, the purpose of United Nations? Uh, I got a couple of thoughts too on this. First of all, word, but we would have a problem because India has pretty much given the, the middle finger to several UN Security Council resolutions, as has Israel. So um, I would love a world that looked like that. But I, I also think that we are, um, at, let me put some, maybe we're just the limits of our national power, given the way in which we're organized. When I think about the problems that are embedded in South Asia, from the military side, we obviously have the seam of the combatant commands. And at first blush, this looks like CENTCOM versus PACOM. So if you're PACOM, you're dealing with Lashkar Taiba throughout your entire theater, be it in India, the Maldives, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Tibet, <laughs> any place it can go, Thailand. And I'm not really exaggerating about those venues. And if you're PACOM, you see that your interests are harmed, but yet you can't do a damn thing about it because the origins of this problem are in CENTCOM. And CENTCOM isn't going to do anything to piss off Pakistan, which will affect the GLOC. So already, if you just think about the same problem uh, between the combatant commands, but, but in reality it's much more complicated than that because you should also have SOCOM involved and you should also have UCOM involved because these groups actually have roots in Europe. So when you think about the way in which our combatant command structures are set up, you realize that we really have no way of generally integrating across the global space in which these, uh, these uh, groups are operating. And our interagency pro process has largely failed to deal with these issues. If you think about the State Department, we technically now with reorganization of state should be dealing with South Asia and Central Asia but the actual DASs themselves are vertically integrated and you don't want to piss in any one of their bathtubs because it's, it's completely predatory and, con and concerned to be, you know, fenced off terrain. And what I find interesting when we look at India, so when India says it's called the Indian Ocean for a reason, what you immediately realize is that not a single one of our government agencies has a policy lens that views the world in the way in which India does. So India has a Look East policy, it has a Southwest Asia policy, it has a Central Asia policy, it has an Africa policy. So we have no way it, within our various interagency processes to synthesize a worldview that can replicate how India sees the world. So I don't really understand how, how the way in which we are organized, the way we organize our, our national security affairs, how we can manage this. I, I will say this much in, in, in shutting up, it's great that for the first time the State Department has begun a process of a quadrennial review. You know, the, the very fact that the State Department had never undertaken the equivalent of the QDR process that the DOD routinely engages in, I think speaks a volume. And then of course the other issue is, is our congressional funding, the way in which we fund what we do. We can talk about a long-term plan to stabilize a country. But in fact, we can't, no president, no secretary of state can guarantee that because at the end of the day, it comes down to the vicissitudes of the Congress and whether or not the administration can persuade them to do this. So maybe we're simply at the limits of our national power to do the things that you suggest. And what we're really left with is basically trying to um, optimize multiple objectives 
uh, while not completely satisfying any of them. Maybe this is a joint optimization problem. Thanks. Can we take the next question? There's a cluster. So hold off on the answers. We're going to gather the questions. Introduce yourself, please. Hi. Subtarsi, second year student at SIPA. Uh, you've discussed how uh, when Indian influence is high in Afghanistan, Pakistan influence is pretty low, and vice versa, and uh, they're kind of unbalanced at all times. Is there a general framework in which you see that both nation, India and Pakistan, would be happy with a scenario in Afghanistan? <coughs> or do you see that the inability for both countries to resolve the conflict in Kashmir, uh, as always an albatross to, any, to disallowing India and Pakistan to agree on any issue anywhere? Thank you. Thanks, Sita. Randy, you? Christine, and the, uh, your discussion on India was illuminating. Um, my question is, is uh, what do you think the minimum conditions need to look like in Afghanistan? Um, some of the things you talked about, two of the objectives to their national security for India related back to Afghanistan. So if that's the case and pulling out would cause regional instability, how do you think we should leave it? What are the minimum objectives that you think we should leave it? Thanks. Hi, I'm Priya. I'm a second year student. Um, my question is for U.S. policymakers after the strategic dialogue that took place this year. What do you think is the strategy towards Pakistan in terms of carrots and sticks, and is it time for more sticks? You want to come in as well? Hi, my name is Asif, and I'm from Rutgers. Um, I, I'm a Pakistani, and I don't always think it's India. Sometimes I think it's Bangladesh. <laughs> for my for a somewhat serious question, um, it's great that you guys are here presenting because there's so many things and so many nuances that you present and facts. And I think some people here generally have a better idea than the common people, or at least you know people in general. Why is it that the perception is is so like one-sided. It's like it's Pakistan's fault. It's it's you know it's black and white. Why is it that? Why isn't the regular public seeing the the intricacies involved? I mean, and kind of like could you address the fact? Will Pakistan become a failed state? Is it is its nuclear program really in danger, or is it just conflated? And how is it that you know Pakistan has such a horrible you know public relations? Mm. You know, if you could address that, and um, yeah. Okay, everybody gets uh, gets a bite at one of these. <laughs> Who's ready, Josh? Ready? Oh, Not me. They didn't ask me. Yeah, everybody's questions. ready. Come on, let's <laughs> let's go on, go on. Start off with Josh on that side. Josh, you ready? I I, I, I didn't get any questions okay. about Central Asia. Okay. I okay. think they can speak more knowledgeably about India and Pakistan. Um, many questions about Pakistan. As brief as I can be. Is there a U.S. strategy for Pakistan? What we can garner from from those strategic dialogue? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, the, the reason is that it appears that the effort on the part of U.S. is to continue to engage Pakistan military. You'll often hear uh, senior government officials in U.S., especially from Pentagon and the military side, saying, uh, well, a lot of this is happening because we lost touch with the Pakistan military in the 1990s. So it appears more and more incentives and money for Pakistan army, a lot of diplomacy, uh, but only promises for democracy. But rhetorically, we often hear from President Obama, from Secretary Clinton, from elsewhere. Again, I again and again uh, refer to WikiLeaks because I think those are very insightful. Uh, there is often mention of this, that we want to support Pakistan's democracy. Uh, but I have not seen any concrete, significant, profound, potent decisions on the part of the United States to support Pakistani democracy, frankly. So if the whole effort is to continue to engage military, if that was providing dividends, well and good. I hope it will provide dividends, uh, but, but I have not seen any, um, any such thing. Why Pakistan image is so uh, poor or pathetic? Um, I also have, uh, being a Pakistani American, uh, I sympathize with that point of view. Uh, but I think the, the kind of problems that Pakistan has faced primarily and principally are because of Pakistan's own failures. Having said that, it's hardly, it's just a 60-year-old country. It will take time for transition. 
time and again, Pakistan's democratic forces um, have regained control. Uh, people always yearn for return to democracy. We have seen revival of uh, this active judiciary, um, which, which asks for rule of law. We have seen this media um, emergence. So there are positive signs as well. But at, at present, so much is happening in terms of negative trends, negative patterns, that Pakistan just can't help. Um, I personally believe in terms of nuclear um, security, Pakistan's, I, I genuinely believe uh, Pakistan's nuclear program is now much more safe than before. And, and that's where one of the positive things has happened um, that is constantly said by, uh, by the U.S. government officials as well. Thank you. I'm going to pick up on some of the Kashmir issues. So I have to say nothing puts me more to sleep other than NyQuil than the mention of the word Kashmir. <laughs> In part because it is, um, it's used as a code word and it has no flesh on it. So let's first dispel any idea that Pakistan has any equities in Kashmir. I don't think it does. What we can say for fairly clearly is that since 1947, Pakistan's involvement in Indian-administered Kashmir has resulted in nothing but bloodshed and misery for Kashmiris. So when I taught at LUMS this summer, it was very shocking to my Pakistani students to hear that, in fact, when you go to Srinagar, the folks there can't stand you and they can't stand India. So you need to get over the idea that somehow your, your, your boys, your bache, are doing anything to help the cause of Kashmiris because they're not. And I could adumbrate this at length because what they've done in Kashmir is appalling. And it begins with eroding the traditional Sufi culture of Kashmir and supplanting it with this Wahhabi stuff that has nothing to do with being indigenously Muslim in Kashmir all the way to more grotesque things like attacking women and disfiguring them, something that has no place and it is completely coming from these external, these so-called mujahideen with their, their backers in Pakistan. That being said, India is largely responsible. If it wants to claim that these Kashmiris are its citizens, it has an obligation to treat them like citizens. And anyone who has been to Srinagar would find it very difficult to say that you would accept to live like this. My interactions with the Indian security forces in, in Kashmir have been absolutely appalling. I'm happy to talk about that at length. Um, if India wants to put an end to this, it needs a strategy to solve the conflict dyad, which is at its, disposable, at its disposal, and that is New Delhi and that is Srinagar. India cannot simply say this is all due to Pakistan. It's absolute rubbish, it's absolute nonsense, and you need only look at the spread of the Indian Mujahideen throughout India to realize this. So I think we need to reframe Kashmir, that this is really about New Delhi dealing with its population in Srinagar, and there have been a number of credible polls at this point that says Kashmiris, and by the way, there are many Kashmiris, there are many Kashmiris. So we're really talking about the valley. There's been multiple rounds of ethnic cleansing. So folks in Ladakh have no love for Pakistan. They're more happy being with India. Folks in Jammu, because of ethnic cleansing, are happy being with India. So what we're really talking about is the valley of folks that says to hell with both of you, may both of your houses burn down. So we really need to get off this whole, you know, this, this Kashmir jalopy. It, it, it's, it doesn't take us anywhere. Going to, this ties into the next issue, which is about Afghanistan. So Barnett Ruman, um, Ahmed Rashid, they've, they have all made this argument that Afghanistan can be solved through Kashmir. I, I, I hope my initial points should tell you that I think that's also fairly nonsensical. But actually, in extrema, while at first blush, our interests in Afghanistan resemble that of India's more than that of Pakistan. We want the place to not be the home to uh, Sunni militants that destabilize the region. In point of fact, the end state that will help us is not going to be the end state that India wants. You know, I've made my point clear that um, I'm with Biden on this, that having a large counterinsurgency footprint makes us more dependent upon Pakistan and are, are therefore more constrained in our ability to think about new carrots and new sticks. Um, so what might work for us, which is some accommodation with the Taliban, is not going to work for India. So at some point, there is going to be a zero-sum game. Maybe what would minimally suffice India is that if we could, could absolutely provide some ironclad assurance, perhaps through the use of drones and, and a sustained counterterrorism presence, that it's not going to be the Afghanistan of the 1990s that terrorized India. Um, and then quickly going to carrots and sticks. Look, we have no paucity of sticks in our legislation to deal with Pakistan. What we have is a paucity of scrotal fortitude to actually 
apply those sticks. What we also have failed to do is to be cognizant of Pakistan's genuine security equities and put forward on the table carrots that are meaningful. Money is not meaningful. It views it as an entitlement. So we can't buy our way. In fact, the WikiLeaks cables have quoted Ambassador Patterson at length saying this. What we really need to understand are what are the political carrots that might actually mean something to Pakistan. I, I have been ridiculed, but I stand by it. I think a conditions-based nuclear, civilian nuclear deal should be put on the table. Why? Not because we want to reward them for proliferating. That's preposterous. Because the Indo-US nuke deal has taken six years. It still hasn't fructified. Yet putting it on the table creates space for negotiation with the Pakistanis, which is simply not possible when they believe we with the Indians and the Israelis want to bomb their nuclear facilities. So we need to not only develop the scroll of fortitude to apply the sticks, which are already embedded in our legislation, but we also need to create new and creative carrots that might actually appeal to the Pakistanis. And if in the end they give us the middle finger and say, Janum Jao, go to hell, then we will have clarified in our own interagency process what Pakistan is about. And it's not about, oh, we're just insecure because of India. And it will clarify in our interagency process that we need to stop hoping for the best with respect to Pakistan and actually start contingency planning for the reality that I think is probably waiting for us. Thanks. I think <laughs> the, um, yeah, we, I guess we'll leave to the next session um, how to rebrand Pakistan. And um, thanks, everybody. I think we've got a five-minute break before coming back.